Thank you. Thank you, it's great to be here. I'm excited to be here today to talk about how we can encourage more professionals, leaders, people, full stop, to talk about their own mental health conditions. As you've heard today, they affect one in four of us, but so far the numbers of people coming forward to speak out about them doesn't reflect that. And we at the Civilian Network believe that if we can encourage more people to come out, we will have a collective power that will encourage and enable everybody to get the care they need. Prejudice and discrimination will go down, funding will go up, and people will get better. So today I'm excited to moderate this panel um, of several people who are either have their own experience with mental health conditions or, or are experts in the area. And the objective of the panel is to move the dialogue further concretely in terms of how we can encourage more people to come forward. I hope at the end of this panel, the Stability Network and the Kennedy Forum and others will take the insights we hear today and concretely move the action plan forward. So let me just say a word about our format. We'll speak um, in a panel format for about 25 minutes and then we'll take questions. And I encourage your questions either at the microphone or through uh, the tablet. Let me now introduce our esteemed panelists. Nasir Gami is a professor of psychiatry and director of mood disorders at Tufts Medical Center. He also lectures at Harvard Medical School and is a leading psychiatric researcher. Please join me. Bob Borston is a senior vice president at Albright Stonebridge Group, a leading commercial diplomacy and global strategy firm based in Washington, DC. He has served in a number of prominent public and private roles. Greg Harris is an Illinois state representative. He was the chief of the appropriations committee in the House. He oversees budgets for many state agencies focusing on behavioral health. And finally, Tony Dreyfus is the co-founder of Metropolis Coffee, one of the country's highest quality roasters. So please join me in welcoming them. So Bob, I'd like to start with you, given uh, that you're a fellow stability leader. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how you're speaking out, albeit very early and at an important point in your career in the White House, enhance your ability to lead and be a professional. That's a good question. Let me begin, however, by uh, thanking Patrick and all those who put together the forum. I have to say that it's kind of depressing to me that Patrick is a former member of Congress. Uh, we kind of lost a lot of sanity in Washington when he disappeared from the scene. Um, so thank you, Patrick. Uh, I was actually public with my uh, mental illness before I went to work at the White House. I was public with it uh, when I was working as a reporter at the New York Times to connect us to the last panel. Uh, what happened was pretty simple. I had a psychotic manic ep episode and I ended up at Payne Whitney. I only go to the best mental hospitals. <laughs> uh, later, I went to McLean up in Boston. Those of you who are alumni know that it is the Rich Carlton of mental hospitals in this country. Um, in any case, uh, I came back from the hospital to work at the Times, and people asked me where I had been for the last month, and I said I was in the mental hospital. It seemed to me to be the right thing to do, frankly. Uh, when you are a reporter, you are supposed to be dedicated to telling the truth, and you're supposed to be open and honest about both sides of the story. But it also was a place, like other places I've worked over time, where people were tolerant, understanding, and not completely freaked out at the thought that I had been not only in the mental hospital, but also in what they euphemistically called the quiet room. Uh, those of you who have shared rooms like that uh, with padded walls know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, so that 
was the reason that I started. By the time I went to the Clinton campaign in 92 and later to the White House, uh, people said I talked too much about it. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I do sometimes, but I consider it uh, part of who I am, and I think it's an important thing to, uh, to let people know that you can do a job, uh, that you can have a family, and that you can function with these kinds of illnesses. Thank you. Tony, do you... <laughs> Tony, you've recently been public about your mental health condition as well. Do you want to pick up on what Bob said? Sure. I uh, didn't have... I, I wasn't very intentional about becoming public about it. Um, I spoke with a reporter uh, who was doing a biography on me for Cranes, and um, I'm not sure what... what uh, inspired me to do so, but I just, for a moment, thought it might be helpful. Um, it has been very helpful, first for me, hopefully for others. I've, I can't tell you how many uh, emails and phone calls I've gotten since, uh, how being vulnerable uh, and, and sharing my vulnerability has helped others to share theirs as well. So it's been a pretty great experience. And Nasir, what is your thinking based on all the research you do on the intersection of mental health and leadership to what extent do you think being public and speaking out enhances people's leadership ability? Well, I think it's, it's important for leaders to speak out. Um, I think it will enhance leadership abilities when people become more aware of it. Um, but let me just pause for just to just comment that um, I have an aunt who had schizophrenia, so even though I haven't had these conditions myself, I've seen it in my own family. She had a very severe case of chronic delusions for 49 years, and uh, my grandparents took good care of her. Um, and, and another personal aspect of this is I probably wouldn't be here if uh, Senator Ted Kennedy hadn't pushed forward the 1965 Immigration Act, which preceded my Im family's immigration from the Middle East here a couple years later. And then if you fast forward 20 years, I was a resident at McLean Hospital, and I um, was a, I had reached the peak of my political career in being a grassroots volunteer for Senator Kennedy in his 1994 re-election campaign against an unknown businessman named Mitt Romney. And um, <laughs> fast forward 20 more years and here I am. So I think that speaks a little bit to our inter interdependence with each other. Um, I, I think there are two very important factors here about self-disclosure. One is that it will address what really is a selection bias in the public consciousness. When the public hears about mental illness, as in the last panel discussed, it's usually bad news, violence, or seeing someone who's homeless on the street. They don't hear about the successful people because the successful people won't talk about it. I know about it because my patients are these successful people. I have businessmen, professors, lawyers, politicians, writers, artists, comedians among my patients. You know about it because you have it, and you talk about it, but very few people do. And so there's this um, vacuum in the public consciousness. That's why one reason it's important to talk about this. The second reason it's important, and these are the two points I want to make, is that a factor in stigma that we don't appreciate, the whole public but also the mental health community, is that stigma continues partly because of an intellectual belief that people with psychiatric conditions are inferior to normal mentally healthy persons. And we need to attack that intellectual belief. We don't do that. We talk about, it, take it from a moral perspective. We have a value that it's bad to discriminate against people. There's human rights, everybody should be treated equally. We heard that this morning, that's great. But one comment that was made that's correct is, you can only get so far with pity. You really do need to take it further and what I've done in my work is, is since I couldn't talk about my, my successful patients because of confidentiality, I got into public figures, historical and political leaders who are out there and, and their lives are public knowledge. But people have not dug into the documents, the medical records, the personal letters, the autobiographical work, which brings out that so many of these people had depression and manic symptoms. People like Churchill and Lincoln and and President John Kennedy, who had severe depression related to his Addison's disease, which he couldn't talk about at all, but now his medical records have been open for about a decade, and it's very clear. And uh, Martin Luther King, who was mentioned over and over again this morning, which I hope we can come back to, because he's my current research project, he had very severe depression repeatedly throughout his life. And what 
we can do by talking about these people who are our heroes is to ask the question, not only d did they succeed despite having these conditions, but did they succeed in some way because they had these conditions? So the scientific research that I've looked at indicates that depression enhances realism and empathy, mania enhances creativity, and makes you more resilient to trauma. And if we can start talking among ourselves about some of these benefits of some of these symptoms, at least when they're mild to moderate, when it's treated and so on, then the benefits can outweigh the harms, and then we can attack this false idea about the inferiority of people with these conditions. And that, those are two great points, and I think that's part of what we're all trying to do in terms of creating other role models, other examples, and not just one or two or five or ten people, but hundreds of people who we all know in our circles. Let me give Greg an opportunity to come in and talk about his experience and the extent to which it's enhance your professional uh, abilities in your role? I guess there's you know, two answers to that, of, you know, why I talk as an elected official you know, openly about you know, a long history of mental illness and substance abuse. Um, one is because I can, and it seems to make, I'm amazed, as you said, the number of people who have come up to me and said, I wish I could talk about it as openly as you do, or I'm going through the same things. Um, I work in the Illinois State Capitol where the DSM-5 is on full display in the halls day in and day out. Some of us are treated, some of us not so much. Um, so that is also a thing. But uh, as, a, uh, as a creature of Illinois politics, you know, when I decided to run for public office, you know, I also know, you know as our, our former, the first Mayor Daley said, you know, politics in Chicago ain't beanbag. And, you know, my history being what it was, you know, it's going to come out one way or another. And for me, it was very important to take control of the story and the narrative and say, this is what it is. You know, take it or leave it. You know, this is who I am. This is, you know, part of what made me want this job is to affect public policy for you know, people who uh, you know, are suffering with some of these conditions that I was able to get help for. Um, and that's what I try to do. Great. And now I want to get a little bit down to brass tacks to really figure out how we get from where we are today to a point where all, all those one in four are speaking openly um, and getting the care they need. Do you all have suggestions from your background or from situations you see at work or in your personal life. I, for me, it's a lot about selling the upside of coming out and then managing the downside, which is people's perception that there'll be backlash from their employers and others. So I'd love to just hear, and it, not just for leaders like yourselves, but how do we bring it down to middle managers and other workers who may not have the political cover that the five of us have had the, the, the good grace to have. Bob, do you want to start? Well, personally, I think that being open about an illness, any illness, makes life easier, not harder. And it makes it easier to cope with the stress because you have a way to release the stress. You can talk about it. And as everyone in this room knows, when you can talk about something, it just makes it all the more smooth. Uh, I think that I have more stress at home with children who are 15, 17, 17, and 21 <laughs> than I'll ever have uh, at work. So uh, I find it kind of amusing, the thought that it's a, a problem in my, in my work. Uh, I have to say, though, that I'm quite honest when I interview for a job about my illness, and by doing so, I think I prepare people in case I have bad days. And I say to them, you know, there are going to be days when I'm not going to be here because you don't want me here on those days. I'm a downer on those days, and I'm not going to be productive. On other days, I'm going to be kind of hyperproductive, don't get worried. People watch after me. I see my shrink every week. But I think that if you are open about those things from the start, if something does go, quote unquote, wrong, 
If you have another episode, if you have a month of problems, as I tend to do in the winter, uh, people are far more accepting than they would be if it comes out of nowhere. Tony, do you want to speak to that? I, I, sure, I'd love to. Um, well, one thing, we're not sitting in a church basement drinking Senka. This is a, an excellent forum for uh, others to you know, feel uh, like th they have the opportunity to, to speak up. Um, I think that for me, there's a, a definition of success, and, and we all uh, put on Facebook our, you know, our brand building of self as, as this perf perfect thing. And it, when we have a, a moment where we're less than perfect, it, you know, everything can come crashing down. And, oh my gosh, what happened? Um, and so I, I think what you said is, is absolutely accurate. It's so helpful to uh, manage expectations, <laughs> I, I suppose. Um, and uh, I, I think that we really do need to um, challenge this notion that, that we're all perfect. Um, uh, I can't say that I have any um, great insight into how to do that. Um, I know that that's very much the point of this. Um, other than uh, each of us telling our stories, our imperfect stories, our authentic stories that, that um, show that we're human. And, and I think people really connect with that. And maybe then they feel uh, compelled to, to tell their own story as well. So maybe if I can just bring up at least the more negative side in my life. So because of my bipolar disorder, I can't possibly work the hours that the people I compete with professionally work. Um, I can't go at a, out at night to events that are required for my profession. I've had a massive anxiety attack while at McKinsey and they, you know, that severely impacted my performance. So I, I on one hand, I'd agree with being open and I obviously am now open in my employer, with my employers, but I think there's a real fear um, of those working not at the leadership level that don't maybe have the latitude uh, to, to take those accommodations. Um, I don't know, Greg, if you want to speak to that. I mean, I could tell you if, if friends of mine come and they say to me, I want to go, you know, I'm, I've just gotten in, out of treatment, I want to go tell the world, you know, I'm like, take, a, take it a little <laughs> easy. You know, once a bell is rung, it cannot be unrung. You know, you might not want to tell everyone right away. You know, give it some thought and do this in a planful way and, you know, think about, you know, who you want to disclose to and, and what order and see how they react. And um, the other thing about people, I, I was in the suicide prevent, uh, workshop just before uh, we came down here. And one of the folks up there said that when you talk about suicide, often you know, people just freeze. They don't know what to say, whether it's about you know, suicide or mental illness or cancer or any other. You know, a lot of people just freeze. And you've just got to understand that that's not a rejection. A lot of people don't know how to respond or talk to folks when they disclose this. So yeah, it's important, I think, for me and for watching other people, not to begin to internalize the reaction of the person who you disclose to if they shut down or don't know what to say or just sort of gurgle and then change the subject. Because uh, a lot of people just don't know how to handle this still. And very practically, the Stability Network is trying to uncover this one in four, and prove, it's proving very challenging. I call it guerrilla networking. Somebody will mention that somebody will mention that somebody had something one day, and you slowly find these people. But even with very concerted effort, talking to community leaders, asking them to tell me who they know who might have X, Y, Z, it's been challenging. So I don't know. I want to turn to Nasir and give him an opportunity to talk about some of the the, the civil disobedience that we heard this morning and Martin Luther King's sort of leadership and what we can learn from that. But let me just give Tony, Bob, and Greg a chance to say anything about, you know, practical advice you would give the Kennedy Forum or the Stability Network in our efforts to make, you know, encourage more people to come out. Well, very, very briefly, um, I think that there's a misconception that mental illness is a binary thing that either you have it or you don't. And one thing that I've learned from disclosing my own story is that there are parts of it that, that people uh, feel is relevant to their own life or their own experience, uh, regardless of whether they have a diagnosis, as I do, of bipolar disorder. Um, so uh, I, I know that it, it, it is very difficult, and not everyone should disclose. And I was certainly very private about it for a very long time. Um, but I, I really do think that it helps to disclose 
is. Um, and uh, I think that it's maybe not one in four, it's maybe in, to some degree four in four. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, by sharing our stories, we, we find relevance in others. Um, I guess I would say that I'm not personally very big on being told what to do. <laughs> uh, it's caused me a lot of problems in Washington. Uh, but uh, I carry that over to the advice that I give people who come to me to talk about whether or not to go public, and that is I lay out the good and the bad and let them make the choice because if they're uncomfortable with it, if they have a certain work situation or, in fact, a certain family situation that doesn't allow for it, then I'm certainly not going to tell them to go ahead and you know, be the bull in the china shop and see what breaks. Uh, I just don't think that's the right way to do it. Um, I've been very lucky, you know. Uh, when I had my first break, it wasn't clear that I was uh, manic depressive. Uh, and uh, it just turned out that my stepfather, many years before, had produced a film called Fear Strikes Out. I don't know whether anybody in this relatively young audience ever saw it. But it's a, a film with uh, Anthony Perkins and Carl Malden in which he plays a Boston Red Sox outfielder uh, who has what is fairly clear to be depression or manic depression. And his father keeps telling him to pull himself up by his bootstraps until he realizes that it's a real illness and he can't do it. So I just happen to have that stepfather there. How many people get that lucky? Uh, I also happen to work for Democrats. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and frankly, uh, as those of you who watched the debate last night know, they tend to be a little more tolerant than the other side. Greg. So I guess in the spirit of full disclosure, I ought to admit that you know, I'm also a Democrat. So <laughs> <laughs> put that out there. Um, there are no 12-step meetings for that. Uh, <laughs> Not a one. But I mean, to me, it's surprising, you know, working in the public sphere, and you probably know this, as soon as you identify publicly the number of people who come up to you in the Capitol behind a door or start calling you and saying, I'm sure it's the same in the business world. Oh my God, I'm glad you said, I'm, this is what I'm going through. And it, 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 it surprises me. Yeah, how many folks are saying we're going through the same thing? Now we finally find somebody we can talk to about not only um, uh, you know, the, the recovery process, but how you deal with it in this particular you know, work life. And you know, what do you do with all the after hours stuff and the receptions and the social or you know, the business meeting, all, all, all this stuff, which you know, we still sort of see, well, you know, we have a lot in common, but then we all live in this little niche. How do you deal with this little niche, too? If I could just, sorry, before we get to the doc here, uh, tell my favorite story about that. When I was at the White House, I joined the National Security Council. In order to be there, I had to have a top-level clearance. And so what did they do? Because you have to admit about everything you've done in your life and everywhere you've worked, uh, they sent the CIA shrink to see me. And he came every three months to check to make sure I was on my meds and that I didn't seem that I was being too glib and so forth. Uh, and after two years of these three month, every three month visits, he turned to me at the end of one of the visits and he said, you know, I think my sister has what you have. Mm -hmm. Strangest places. Mm -hmm. And Tony, I just wanted to echo one of the things you said, because I heard it from somebody in the audience before the session, which is this notion of continuum, and that we're all, and many more than one in four of us, are somewhere on the continuum. And I think people with lived experience, or however we describe it, um, benefit from creating a big tent and not have it be sort of us versus them, but rather we're all sort of in it to some degree. And we go in and out of it all the time. So that's a very important point. But Nasir, let me turn to you. We heard this morning about the importance of creating a movement, and obviously a movement has started um, long ago on these issues, and we're, we're just hoping to support it to gather strength. What have you learned in your research that you think might be relevant to advise us on how to create a movement around these issues? 
You know, I, th I think that one thing that's important from the civil rights movement and also the, the gender rights movement is that they didn't approach it just from the perspective of changing laws. They approached it from the perspective of changing cultural attitudes as well. And the cultural attitudes piece is much more complex. And uh, that's where, uh, for instance, Dr. King was, even into the 60s, consistently pushing back on the concept that uh, African Americans are inherently inferior to whites. We need to keep, we need to do that. We have not done that yet. And, and this needs to be done at a scientific level and an empirical level. And it's not about opinion. It needs to be, it's a fact that there is more creativity when you're manic. There is more empathy when you're depressed. So if you want empathic, creative people, become manic depressive. That's the way you, you can get that. Or, you know, we can go to businesses and say, look, you want creative people, you want realistic people to work for you, you got to hire people with bipolar illness and depression. That's what it's linked to. So we need to start look, pulling at it from what, what people accept. And, and, but we don't do that. We don't connect it. Partly because I have to say, there's a lot of stigma within the mental health community. We need to be honest about this. Clinicians roll their eyes once they have a patient with bipolar. They'd rather treat the guy with anxiety. And so we need to get over that ourselves. We need to become aware of this. Most clinicians don't know about these things I've just said. Most people with the illnesses don't know, much less being able to tell other people. My experience from, from doing some of this work, when I published The First Rate Madness a few years ago, was I got a lot more people coming to me who were businessmen, entrepreneurs, and so on, who had never sought help before. And they said, once I understood that there are some benefits to this and it's not completely bad, I'm willing to seek help. So I, I think this is an avenue to get at, you know, why is it hard to get to come out? Because the culture doesn't accept that. How do you fix that? Changing the cultural attitudes. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. I want to allow for questions if there are any. Um, <clears throat> go ahead. Thank you. Another great panel and a day of them. This actually follows up a little bit on <clears throat> what the doctor was just saying. I'd like to touch on and ask you to respond to uh, the notion that some of us individuals with lived experience to share and express are in the arts, uh, in my case, the performing arts, uh, someone with mental illness working collaboratively with a partner who does not have it around issues that include mental illness but are not restricted to it. And some people will tell their own life story and others like me as a fiction writer will tell the life story of a character that is informed by our struggles, including with mental illness. And uh, I think this is another way for creatives to lead. And I would just also tie it into the prior panel and say that you get really good media coverage huh. often when you've got a presentation, a performance, a musical slash theatrical program that introduces an audience to a young woman for 90 minutes and lets the audience get to know her and notice areas of commonality, even though she struggles with these things and maybe they don't. And uh, the press will cover that as an event, and even people who don't go to the event might learn something about the conditions. Thank you. And I can say in Seattle, we've done at least one storytelling show, which was quite humorous, but all of us had mental health conditions, and we got an incredible amount of media uh, in the print and TV. So I think, as the media panel said as well, trying to create an intersection of mental health issues with the arts, with other sectors, really broadens the appeal. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, Representative Harris, I've uh, known you for a, a long time, and uh, you're one of my heroes, and sure. I'm not sure that I've ever thanked you for it. And for the uh, other members, uh, I don't know you very well, but you're now going to become one of my heroes. Um, but uh, Representative Harris, I follow you fairly closely on Facebook. And I know that you get up ungodly early often to go to Springfield. I, I know from Facebook that you have incredibly bad taste in movies. <laughs> um, I, I know Thank that you, you have a cat. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think you've ever spoken on Facebook or any other public forum that I've seen you at 
about your history of uh, recovery or your dealing with mental illness. Uh, you're I, looking I at the wrong I, days because I talk about it pretty often. I always talk about my anniversary dates. So in between the Sharknado posts and Bacon posts, you will see <laughs> some recovery related. So I, I, just, I just missed it. I, I assumed it was because um, uh, it just isn't that important to you anymore, that you're in recovery and it's something in your past. But that's just not true, is it? No, it's something I deal with every day. I don't talk about Sharknado every day, you know, so you know, there are <laughs> days where I talk about more than others, and the same with my recovery, so I, I try to have some balance. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Joan Green, and thank you all for coming out. Well, most of you. And uh, I want you to know that I am the mother of a, a daughter who has schizophrenia. She also was a honor student graduate from Cornell. She has a, a law degree and a master's in law degree. Now, I have to admit that it is a hard sell to ask someone to come out about schizophrenia in the workplace, especially as an attorney because we have not changed the thinking of the business community around this issue of mental illness enough. However, I do have a suggestion for helping to change the attitudes of people, and that is within the churches and synagogues, that we can, we can start creating caring communities. We have done that in the Unitarian Universalist Church in Oak Park. We have a welcoming uh, attitude toward everybody who has a mental illness. We speak openly, most of us, about what the mental illness is, and uh, the minister will give sermons about it. How often do you hear that from the, how often do you hear a sermon about mental illness from the clergy? And yet, as we're saying today, it's an everyday occurrence for so many of us. And, uh, and so I, I urge you to go back to your churches and synagogues and talk to your clergy about, uh, you know, starting a caring community. It's something we can do without money, but it, and it is something that's very viable to do. Thank you. And I would say community conversations like that, as I understand from the research, are incredibly valuable. And I think churches or schools, um, businesses, business groups um, are all wonderful places. So it's something, as you say, that we can all do individually in our own communities. So I encourage you um, to do that. We've got some other questions here. OK, thank you, panel, uh, for the conversation. Uh, I'm Tom Smith uh, with the Carla Smith Foundation. Carla is my daughter, had bipolar disorder and died by suicide in 2003. And our foundation tries to support families of those who are dealing with mental illness or suicide. I was going to say something similar to what the previous uh, uh, questioner or commenter said about the, the, the possibility of faith-based communities. Uh, but I want to add one other thing, and that is this. Among uh, our services, we do support groups. And one theme that continually comes up in our support groups uh, for families and friends of people with some form of mental illness is that the people sitting around that table are willing to go more public with their uh, situation in their family, but their loved one is not. Uh, is there any suggestions or any comments you might have on, on a one-to-one -one basis uh, what can you say to, or how can you might, how might you encourage people who are afraid to go public, and not just in a workplace, but go public, even with their cousins? Uh, anything you might suggest that might uh, help us help them uh, move that step forward, because they are all, and we are too, all in agreement that more people who do become public makes it better and safer for all of us. Well, I typically say everybody has to find their own journey, and so as Bob was saying earlier, um, we wouldn't say, you know, encourage somebody too strongly to do something they're not comfortable with. Everybody is on their own path. 
Um, but often it just helps to say, what are you, what are you afraid of? What's, what worries you? What, what do you think could happen? And just kind of talk through some of the scenarios. I, I think it's just listening and, and being with the person over time. If I could just add to that, um, I often think that the families of people who have serious mental illness are worse off than the people who have the illness for long periods of time. That's right. Uh, the, fr the fact of the matter is it's kind of fun to be manic at times. <laughs> uh, but there's nothing fun about being a family member watching somebody, you know, rise up and then eventually end up in psychosis. Uh, a couple of things that I would say. I would say, first of all, make, make, urge the individual to know that the family is there to support whatever they want to be and do. I think that's a very important thing. Uh, when I made the kind of decision I made to be public, very public, about my illness, my family was completely supportive of that, uh, of that decision. The second thing is to try to introduce them to people who have already gone public so that they can clear out the fears faster than if they're just sitting there stewing to themselves over what may happen or may not happen. And could I just add, I, I know there's plenty of social workers in the audience who are probably thinking this. It's not just the people who have the illnesses who need attention, it's the families. And the part of the reason the families have a problem is that no one's attending to them. So family therapy or the support groups like Depression Bipolar Support Alliance, obviously going to be very important. Every patient I see, I give them a sheet, and among other things, I recommend that the family members go to the local DBSA groups. And one general comment I want to make, slightly tongue-in-cheek, is one way we can further destigmatize uh, illness is to stigmatize health. So <laughs> people need to realize that there's more than one way to be okay. And one of the cardinal features of mental health is conformity. You just got to read Emerson's essay on self-reliance and you'll, you'll see. That's what he was saying, that the cardinal virtue of society is to conform. And mental health is a way that we conform. What we call mentally ill, or various kinds of psychiatric conditions, is variations from the norm. And the more we get comfortable with the variations, just like we have now with sexual orientation and other things, the more people will be able to come out. So that's, a, that's just a general aspect I wanted to add. Thank you. Hello, I'm Christine Walker, and I founded the Chasing Hope Foundation through our own family's experience with our son, who is now 15 and has been in therapeutic boarding school since the age of seven, uh, currently out of state. So we founded an organization that creates supportive housing for middle and high school students to stay in their own communities and attend day schools instead of going out of state to boarding schools. So um, I'm wondering, as I've been listening to the conversation uh, today, and to thank you again for coming forward with your own story. We all gain strength from that. It seems like we need possibly a little rebranding. Um, the word mental illness is really scary to those who are outside this room. And words like get help can appear defensive. Um, if you had a lump on your breast, nobody would say, well, get help. They would say, find care get answers, find relief, other things that when we think of it in terms of other health issues, how do we respond to those? And I think the other uh, question about creating a caring community, why do people not come out more? Um, I think there's still a strong association with uh, mental illness being negative. Cuckoo's Nest, we're fresh off of Halloween where we saw insane asylum haunted houses and straight jacket costumes and we still have that environment. So if we want to care for someone and to help them be public with their condition, perhaps we want to use different words that make it less scary for them to know that there won't be this awful loss of control. Treatment does work. And we're going to treat you from the neck up as well as the neck down. And I'm wondering what suggestions you might have to that. Well, maybe um, mental hygiene is a good way to think about it, where we all have to take care of our teeth, and we go get our checkups at the doctor, and 
one way to begin to destigmatize it and to make it more normal is we all need to go through our mental hygiene routine. Um, it certainly helped me a while back. Um, but I, I, I completely agree. I think the words are, are, are hurtful. Um, it's an illness. It's a recovery. It's, um, and and it, it, it does put someone in an awkward position. I also agree. I think the word mental illness is too general and vague. If you just translate it to physical illness, you would see how it doesn't work well. Um, it's been used a lot today, and every time it's used in my mind, I have a little bell that goes off, wondering what would be a better term. I think it's probably better just to be specific. Just to give you an example, I, I recently had a blog post where I wrote up some of my research on Dr. King and his depression, and he had manic symptoms, so I think he had manic depressive illness. But the, at this website, which was part of WebMD, they changed the title to Mental Illness. Martin Luther King struggles with mental illness. So when they published it that way, I started getting all this hate mail, uh, which was kind of ironic, getting hate mail for the Apostle of Love. But um, he got a lot of hate mail in his day. But I told him, change the title to Manic Depressive Illness, not Mental Illness. And as soon as they did that, every, it cooled off a bit. So I think if we can be specific, are we talking about manic depressive illness, depression, anxiety illnesses, ADD, schizophrenia? What are we talking about when we talk about a specific issue? Or if we're going to be more broad, we need to come up with a better term. You know, I say psychiatric conditions, something like that. That's broader enough, a little more technical. But I think you have a very good point about a brand problem with that, that phrase. Thank you. I think we have time for just one more. Two more, two more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll get right to the point. Um, I'm wondering uh, where you all think that peer support and peer networks can um, have a role in the conversation that's been taking place, um, as well as what those might look like um, and how they could be achieved. Um, I, we work very closely with a number of peer support specialists and have them as part of our network in general. I also do work on improving the mental health system in Seattle, and I believe peer support specialists play a crucial role. Um, and the question is just how to make sure they get the training and support necessary. Um, but absolutely, it, it's part of this. If anything, they're on the leading edge because they are already speaking out. We have a lot to learn from their courage, um, and, and they help complement those of us who are here today. My name is Kevin Lavin. First and foremost, I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and an addict. Uh, due to the grace of God, I've been sober for a lot of years. But a lot of years ago, after I was sober for 12 years, I went through a god-awful depression, and I didn't know it. I didn't know what to do, so I turned to what I knew worked, and that caused me two years of hell. When I was in treatment, I uh, talked to my counselor and said, I'm losing it. I want to leave. I want to jump in front of a car. And he said, go pray. So the third time he told me to go pray, I said, I'm praying that I don't kick your ass. I need help. It was at that point another counselor got involved and uh, introduced me to Seroquel, which saved my life at the time. I now run a non-for-profit halfway house. There's three locations in Blue Island. And I'd have to say about 80% of our people are dual diagnosed. And I believe since state budget's not signed, the people who need it the most are getting it the least. <clears throat> I think Lydia House is here, and they're doing a tremendous job with 412 mentally deranged people, and they're getting no help. I can survive. I don't know about others. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists and all of you all, um, and we look forward to future sessions. Thank you.